guys, this is the lecture for section 9.3 part B, which is the last lecture for this first unit. Um, after this, we're going to be gearing up for the test, which as um, those of you who were present at our live session on Friday, you're aware that the test is going to get posted on Wednesday. You will have two hours within which time you can take the test and submit it. That is the only time when the link will be available. And then after that, we will discuss the test during our live session this coming Friday. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Give it a second. There it is. Excellent. Okay. And as you can see, this is uh, section 9.3B. I'm just going to get rid of these distractions back here so that we don't have anything messing with our visual. Okay. So as you know, in section 9.3A, we started talking about relations. And we basically discussed that relations is a way of discussing that there is a relationship between the elements of one set and the elements of another. And if you recall, we could come up with those relations by doing what's called the Cartesian product or the cross product of those two sets. And then that resulting set that occurs when you do that from there, you take the subset of, that res of those results that fall within the parameters of the relationship that you've established. So if we say, for example, that we're looking for, um, all the states that border on the on the Pacific Ocean, right? That would be the, the relation that we're looking for. And in one set, we could potentially have uh, numbers one, two, three, four, five. And in the other set would be the names of the five states that border on, on the Pacific Ocean, right? In fact, I don't think it's five states, I think it's like three. But the idea being that you could do that, right? And that's how you could create those two sets. You do the cross product of them. And then the answer obviously would be only the ones that fulfill what we're talking about. Well, as you know, that creates a relationship between these two sets. And we talked about the results of, the, of that cross product or that relationship. We always talked about them in ordered pairs. Please keep that in mind because today we're going to talk about functions, which is a very specific type of relationship. When we discussed in, that, in section 9.3, the different kinds of relationships that exist, could exist between two types of sets, we were talking that we were talking about it sort of in broad terms. Now we're going to talk about very specific relationships, which are called functions who fall within a, um, follow us a whole set of rules themselves that specifically identify them as this kind of special type of relation. Okay. And here is that definition. If you can look at it here with me, a function is defined, okay, and it's a, and like I said here, it is a specific type of relation. A function is defined as a relation where it matches each element of the first set. Think about it as set A. Another good way to think about this as the X's, and you'll see in a minute why that's important, or the input variable. And again, all these terms, keep them in mind because they're gonna become important in a little bit. So the first set, a relation is one, a function rather, is a relation in which you match the elements of that first set, set A, or the X's, or the input variable, to one element from the second set, okay? That being, think of that second set, and I'm going to draw a little line of that here. Think of that second set as your set B, or your Y's, or your output. Okay, keep those terms in your head because in a minute, that's going to make a whole lot more sense. Okay, so in such a way, and here's the important part. So let me try again. The definition of a function is a, specific, a special type of relation in which you match each element from set A or the X's or the input to an element from set B or the Y's or the output so that, and that's the important part, in such a way that no element from the first set, set A, or the X's or the input, is assigned to two different elements from the second set, or set B, the output. Basically, in layman terms, because this is the fancy schmancy math way of saying it, in layman terms, 
you can have all the elements in the first set or your X's can only have one corresponding value in the second set or the Y's, okay? So for example, and that's what we're gonna look at here. For example, let's say that this was the function we're looking at, okay? And in this case, we're talking about um, people and social securities, okay? This is a function, and we're gonna use for this, uh, for our purposes right now, we're gonna use the arrow as representation of our function. This function matches one person, the set of all people with social security numbers, to one specific social security number, the set of all social security numbers, okay? So over here, we have the set of all the people that need or have a social security number. That's this set right here. And over here, we have all the potentially available social security numbers. That's this set right here. And the function wherein they are matched one person to one social security number that fulfills the requirements of being a function, meaning they're only matching one element from the first set to one and only one element from the second set, okay? And that kind of makes sense if we talk about it in the context of people and social security numbers, because as you know, we're aware that one person cannot or should not have more than one social security number, right? So that kind of fulfills that. But the best thing that I want you to know or make note of is, and, and this is the way I think about it that makes the most sense, okay? If we think about it as a set of X's and Y's, and in a minute you're gonna see why I keep thinking of it that way because we're gonna be talking about ways that we can, we can represent functions and we can represent them graphically. And as you know, when we graph things, we have X's, we have Y's, right? X's can only have one and only one Y they go to, okay? However, the reverse does not break the rule for functions, okay? What's in blue here, that is the only way you're allowed to have a function. One X must go to only one unique Y. However, you can have a Y that has several X's it goes to, and that does not break the rule for functions. Just a little, like, sort of a side note to have in your head, okay? And I am going to just sort of get rid of that now, but keep that in mind. All right, let's talk about some kinds of functions that you can run into. One of the functions that you can run into is what we call a sequence, okay? A sequence, if you recall, is a list of numbers, okay? We usually call those uh, numbers terms, and they are arranged in an order where the first term is what we call the initial term, okay? And sequences, we can have several kinds of sequences. You can have the first type of sequence you can have is an arithmetic sequence, okay? This is, for example, counting by twos, counting by fives, counting by tens. These are all arithmetic sequences. An arithmetic sequence is defined as a sequence in which the successive terms all differ by the same number. So when we're counting by twos, the initial term is too different from the next term and the next term is too different from the following term and so on and so forth. So each of the terms differ from each other by the same number. And here you see an example of that, okay, where we're counting by twos and we've got two, which is our initial term. Uh, let me do that like this, there we go. We have two, which is our initial term and it differs from the next term by a plus two because we add two to that and we get to the next term. And it differs from the next term by two again. We add two to the four, we get to the next term, which is six. We add two to the six, we get to the next term, which is eight. So these are, this is a sequence you guys are familiar with. This here is how we would write it out in general terms when we're trying to talk about how this kind of sequence would go on and on and on. Eventually you have a number that you add the consistent um, value that you're adding every time, right? Because remember it says that the sequence differ by the same number. So you have the number in the sequence that you're talking about represented by N. And then the amount that you add every time gets represented by D. And because in this case, we know we're counting by twos, we know that D always increases, right? By two. So by doing that, we can take this kind of arithmetic sequence and you'll find that it always ends up taking this form and eventually, this is how we write an arithmetic, the general format for an arithmetic sequence, where 
this is the term you're talking about. This is the value you're adding every time. Um, the, the place where it is in the sequence, and this is the value that you're adding every time, okay? Now, another sequence we can talk about is called a geometric sequence. And again, this is one that you've probably seen before. One quick little note that I wanna make for you is this here, this kind of sequence should be ringing a little flag in your head that looks a lot like what we call a linear function or, or rather a function that talks about how you make a straight line. So that's a little flag that should be ringing in your head. That this is sort of a general way to talk about what happens in a linear function. Because as those of you who are probably aware or you've run into this before, linear functions are those functions that one, fulfill the, the definition of a function, meaning that the x's only go to one y. And two, the way it changes is that it always increases by an amount that is predictable. We call that the constant, right? The constant rate of change. That's what we call it. And it basically that's what we're, we're showing is happening here in an arithmetic sequence. Now, when we look at a geometric sequence, okay, what you should notice is that this should also remind you of another kind of function that you've heard people talk about before or discuss in graphs. So, so just pay attention and see if that little flag starts to ring in your head. So a geometric sequence is defined as a sequence in which each term after the first one, right? The first one being the initial term can be found by multiplying by each term by the same amount, okay? So you can see the example for that here. Here's our initial term. We multiply by three and we get to the next term, which is three. Then we multiply by three and we get to the next term, which is nine. Then we multiply by three and we get to the next term, which is 27 and so on and so forth and so on and so forth. So again, the form that we can use um, is this is the general form right here that we could use to state a geometric sequence. And the little red flag that should be going off in your head right now is that this looks a lot like what we call an exponential function. Okay, so that's just a little red flag that should be going off in your head. This looks a lot like what we call the general format for an exponential function. And we're going to talk about that more later on, but I'm just sort of giving you little red flags for you to be aware of as we get going. Okay, now if you want to see a little bit more about that, you can look at table 9.1 on page 379 of your textbook. So you can look a little further at how they came up with the general form for this geometric sequence. Okay. Uh, last but not least, another sequence we can look at is what's called a rectangular sequence or rectangular numbers. Okay. And this one is defined as, okay, it's defined as numbers that can be represented as an array. Okay, where the number of dots of the shorter side is always one less than the number of dots of the longer side. Okay, so here's the example that we're looking at. Okay, if we want to do, for example, one times two, we can represent that as the shorter side is one times the longer side, which is two. And one times two gives us the answer of two. If we want to look at, for example, two times three, we can also represent that as a rectangular sequence or rectangular number or as an array, okay? Because again, the shorter side is two, so we've got two going down and the longer side is three, so we've got three going across. And when we do that, what do we get? We get six, okay? This, by the way, is the way we, we use to help make concrete visual pictures for children when we first initially introduce multiplication, all right? Now, the general form that we can use for this kind of sequence is right here, okay? Um, and it kind of, what I want to draw your attention to is this right here. See this format right here? It should be red flagging you that this is very similar to the general format for what we call a quadratic function, okay? So already just talking about these different sequences that fulfill the requirements of functions, we've sort of already touched in general form these three um, functions that we are gonna become very familiar with, all right? So now let's talk about exponential growth, 
Okay, we, I, told, I mentioned to you before when we were here that geometric sequence, their general format looks a lot like the general form that we use for writing the equation of an exponential function. But let's talk about exponential growth, okay? When we're talking about exponential growth, we define exponential growth. Um, actually, let's do that instead. We define exponential growth, okay? We define it as rapid increase by a power of two. So the general form usually looks like this, okay? Where we're saying for every number, it's increasing by two to the power of that number, okay? That's the general form. And you can see a good example of that, um, showing you how the growth of an amoeba is exponential. If you look at table, 9.3 on page 380, okay? Now, we're gonna take a little break about talking about what is a function and some uh, examples of functions that are uh, in the sequences that we've looked at. We're gonna take a little break from that and we're gonna talk about what's called function notation. This is basically the way that we choose to write a function to uh, numerically or symbolically represent on paper a function that we're talking about. Okay, and it's important that you be familiar with it because this, there's a real big push for students to get a lot more familiar with what's called function notation when they're talking about functions, when they're writing equations for things like linear functions, exponential functions, quadratic functions. Okay, now function notation, a couple things for you to know. First, a function notation, you usually name it with a letter of the alphabet. Okay, we'll say uh, this function, I'm going to call it f. So function f is the of the function wherein it's going to assign the elements from one set okay to another set all right and basically that's what the function is going to do and this right here is the general format for how we would write that that that's what the function is going to do it's going to assign the elements from one set to another now Another thing that you want to be aware of is if the elements from the first function, so let's say that if lowercase a is an element in function a, in, in set a rather, let me say that again. Let's say that lowercase a is an element in set a, okay, then the function notation for showing that when we take that element and we put it through the function and it becomes part of set b, and it's assigned to set B, we would write it like this. This is how we would write it. We would say that that is F of A or the function of that element, okay? The best way to describe this and is to think of it this way. If we have set A, and here's where I once again mention X's and Y's, okay? If we have set A, which is our X's, and we take those X's, and let's say that in set A, we have element A, okay? and we take that element and we put it through the function, we haven't defined what that function is yet, but when we take element A and we put it through that function, it ends up having some kind of value over here. That value that it has is the corresponding value in the second set, okay, in set B. So basically what this is telling you up here, okay, is that functions, Basically, you start with the items in set A, you put them through the function, and the result creates the second set. And that's why we say that when we talk about a function, a function says, and that's what we have over here, is that it assigns the elements from one set into another set. So in essence, in essence that second set gets created when we take the elements from one, put it through the function, and then we get the, the corresponding values and that creates the second set, okay? For example, to look at a function that you're familiar with, if we look at even numbers, even numbers is a function, okay? In which the set of even numbers, okay, is where we're counting those numbers, okay? And we are counting them, we are assigning them to, through the function of counting by twos which will then give us an answer, and those answers will always be doubled wherever we started. So we would write that function as the function of n, where every element that we take out of set A, okay, which is the set of numbers, when it goes through this function of evens, 
this is what will happen to it and we will get a corresponding value, which will be the second set, okay? Um, and then uh, your textbook wants you to just have a, a particular note right here that says that we can use variables to represent functions and to represent the elements. So that's why I'm trying to use um, capitals versus lower cases so to not get you confused, but just know that we can use variables to represent both, not only the function itself, but also the elements that we're taking from one function, from one set that we're putting through the function to get us the corresponding values that become the set B, okay? Let's look at an example where we're putting it into practice, okay? So let's look at this right here, let's practice. Let's say they, uh, they want you to express the following example, this one right here, at, and use function notation for it, okay? So let's read the problem. The problem says that the cost of a taxi ride, so the cost would be what I wanna find out, so that's what I'm gonna use to name my function. That's the function, the cost of a taxi ride. Figuring out the cost of the taxi ride is the function that I want to make happen, right? Here's the information they're going to give me so that I can figure out what elements I need from what set to put them through this function to figure out what I'm gonna get on the other side, okay? So the cost of the taxi ride, they're, they're telling me that it, they, they charge me at a rate where they're gonna start by charging me a flat rate of $1.75, plus then they're gonna charge me 75 cents per quarter mile, okay? Now, I, and then they're telling me, hint, quarter miles, four quarters equals one mile. I'm probably gonna to wanna to talk about it in a per mile situation. So just to be aware that I have to multiply by a factor of four because the price they gave me is per quarter mile, right? So then I'm gonna name my function. I'm gonna name it the cost of a taxi ride. Now, what is the cost of a taxi ride dependent on? What is causing my cost to change? Well, what's causing my cost to change is how far I go or the miles, right? So this is a function of miles. My cost is a function of miles. Therefore, this miles would be my first set, however far I go. So depending on how many miles I've traveled, that's my set A. When I put them through this function of cost, I'll find out how much I have to pay, okay? So my, my function is the cost, it is, a, it is being affected by the miles I travel. And how can I calculate what's happening? Well, I get charged a flat rate plus the 75 cents per quarter mile. So it's really 75 cents times four times whatever mile it is, right? Because it's 75 cents per quarter mile. So every mile that I travel is divided into four and they charge me 75 cents for the first quarter then the second quarter and the third quarter and the fourth quarter. That's my first mile. Then I travel my second mile and they do that again. So this is how I could write in function notation what's happening. I would say, and I'm gonna write it one more time to make sure that you're clear here, okay? I would say that the function of the cost of my tuck taxi ride is based on the miles I travel. So it is C of M. C is the name I've given my function, cost. And I chose C because I'm talking about cost, right? Of M, I've named the variable because that is the thing that makes the change happen. What makes the change happen is my miles. So C of M, and how do I calculate that change? is equal to what they told me, a flat rate of $1.75 plus 75 cents per quarter mile. So that's four times M or the miles. So now when I wanna figure out what's going on, I put into this function, how many, many miles I've traveled and out it spits out the cost that I'm going to pay, okay? Here are some ways that we can represent functions, but there are some limitations, so I want you to pay attention to the limitations for that, okay? One way we can represent functions is by using what's called an arrow diagram. However, be aware that arrow diagrams are really only good to represent functions if the set that you're starting with, set A, and the values that you can get out of it once you put it through the function, set B, 
are finite, meaning they have very specific limitations and they have a few number of elements. So when I know that, when I know that the sets I'm gonna be dealing with are finite, meaning I'm dealing with a few elements, I can represent a function by using an arrow diagram. I, for example, could say, okay, my set that I'm gonna start with is my set of vowels, okay? The function I'm putting it through is how many of those vowels there are, okay, and I'm calling my function g, and what happens is when I take each vow vowel and put it through function g, it gives me the number of where that vowel is in the order it appears in the alphabet, right? So if I put in the vowel a through my function, turns out that's the first vowel I run into. I put in vowel e through my function, it turns out um, I it, the, the what comes out of it is two because it's the second vowel that I run into. I take vowel I, put it through my function of G as to where the, my function G, we could call it um, where in the alphabet is this, uh, does this vowel show up? And when I put it through that function G, it turns out that it's the third vowel I run into in the alphabet, okay? So this is right here what we call an arrow diagram to represent functions and therefore I could say that my function g of a, the vowels, okay, is equal to one. My function of g of a is that I get one. My function of g of e is that I get two. I could write that my function of g of u, okay, is five, right? Because it's the fifth vowel I run into. Now another way to represent functions is to write them in a table. And again, tables are useful if we're talking about a set A that is finite, meaning I only have so many. If I'm, if I'm talking about a function where I can have an infinite number of elements in the set that I'm starting with that I'm going to put them through the function, then a table could be tedious because it can go on and on and on and on forever. Although we're going to talk about how we can sort of get around that, okay? But if it is a finite, set, again, like we've just talked about with the arrow diagrams, then I could say here is my set A, okay, and here are the elements of set A, and when I put them through the function, here are the values that I get, okay? So you can see how that could be a useful way of visually representing um, a function. Now, this, by the way, is my favorite way of representing functions when teaching this concept to children because it makes it more visual and sort of easier to understand. And this is called functions as machines, okay? So functions as machines. And here is why I mentioned the terms input and output before, because if you think about it, input is your X's or that set A where you're getting all your initial elements. You put them through the function. So this right here is the function, okay? And we think of the function as a machine. And then when it comes out the other end, you get the corresponding value that belongs in the second set. And we call that the output. If you see it here, we call it the output, okay? And we think of that as the Y or set B. And this is the input. We think of that as the X's or set A. And it's good for you to tie those things together in your mind as you remember them. Think of them this way um, because it becomes really useful later when you're talking about things like linear functions and so on and so forth. So if we think about it as a machine, which is my favorite way of explaining it to uh, children or students that have never seen these concepts before, you take your input value, okay, from your set A, which in this case is three, and you put it into the function. In this case, the function is that we're going to square that, okay? That's our function, x, that we're gonna square it. So we take three, we put it through the function of squaring it. Well, three squared is three times three, and the value I get out of it is nine, which becomes the element that goes into the resulting set of my y's, okay? And that is my output. So this is my favorite way of discussing functions. Um, because I think it just makes it very concrete and visual, but you can talk about functions as a table, you can talk about functions as arrow diagrams, but these are only good if the functions you're going to discuss are finite and have few elements, okay? Whereas I find this opens itself up a little bit more to general. You could have 
this, in this case, for example, if the function is x squared, that's not a finite. We could go on and on and on, just pick any number and put it through this function, right? And this, by the way, they're showing you here, this is how you would write this function in function notation. You would say it's the function m of the variable x, the, uh, the, the input, whereas when you put it in, it's always going to get squared, okay? And then this is how you would get a uh, real example of where you chose an input or x value. You put it through the function, and it turns out the corresponding y or output that you get is 9, okay? Now, why we're relating, why we're talking about functions after we talked about relations? Because if you recall, relations always showed up as pairs and functions will show up as ordered pairs, okay? That's the solutions that we get from functions almost always give us an ordered pair because this is a way of listing the set of ordered pairs for the function, okay? Now you'll notice that here it says it's useful with finite sets. It, we can also apply it to infinite sets. And you're going to see that in a minute here in the note. But here's what they mean by saying that we can talk about functions as ordered pairs, right? Here's the example. We have set A, again, is the set of our vowels. The function we're putting it through is the function that tells us where this is going to show up in the alphabet. And the result is that the output is set B that shows us that where each vowel is located in the alphabet, okay? We can write this as an ordered pair function. So we'll say here is the function, we're calling it f, and we're writing it as the ordered pairs of a is first, e is second, i is third, and you'll notice that we have first the input, then the output, first the input, then the output, first the input, then the output, or first x, then y, okay? So you see how ordered pairs are important, and the name ordered means that the order in which you write them is also important, okay? So we could write it like this. We could write this function as an ordered pair, but if we're talking about functions that have infinite domains or an infinite number of x's, okay? Because I don't know if I pointed it out. I did not, but I'm going to point it out in a minute, okay? then we can define it as an ordered pair, but you have to use what's called set builder notation. This is where it allows it to be more general. Here's what set builder notation would look like, okay? If I'm gonna take the function where the elements of A are gonna go and give us B, and this function is gonna square whatever I put through it, okay? Then I would say that the function, okay, F of whatever number I got from set A, will turn into n squared. So f of n equals n squared. That is how I write it in function notation. But what I can do to show that there's an infinite number of possibilities is I can write it in set builder notation. That's where you use these brackets. And, I, and I'm saying the ordered pair of the solution that I'm going to get, where I'm going to get an a and a b, such that whatever I get for b is equal to a squared, where a is any whole number. This way of writing the function right here is the set builder notation way. And it's a way that we choose to write it when we're talking about functions that can have an infinite number of solutions, okay? All right, now we're gonna get to how we like to really look at functions, which is the ways that we can visually see them represented. It's also the way we tend to talk about it the most when we're teaching it. Okay, and that's what we're going to look at functions as graphs. We're going to look at functions um, as formulas, and we're going to look at them as they can be seen as a geometric transformation. These are the most popular ways of discussing functions, and it's usually where the term function comes up. Okay, so let's talk about graphs. As you know, graphs give you ordered pairs of a function that you can then represent on a two-dimensional coordinate system, okay? So for example, if I take that function we were talking about where the f of x equals x squared, where every element of x or element from set A, x, the x's or the input, goes through the function and we square it and every corresponding value would then be the squared value of what we put in, right? The ordered pairs that would represent that would look like this. It would be the element I put in and then the result of having put it in there. So we can write it in function notation as x and f of x 
or the way you're probably most used to seeing it, which is X and then the result, which is Y. And this sometimes gets referred to as input, output. Okay, so you can see how I was telling you it's good to sort of tie these things together because in essence, it's just different names for the same information, okay? So let's look at this graph, okay? This graph is saying we have this function, all right? And you can see that this is coming to you from 9 .2, figure 9.27 on page 383. We have this function that we've plotted the points, okay? Remember, this is my function. My function is uh, for every x I put in, I get an x squared. So if I put in one, one squared is one. So there's my first point, there's my first ordered pair, right? If I put in x equals two, two squared is four, so this is my second point, right? I go two and this is four. If I put in my next x value as three, three squared is nine, so there's my next ordered pair. If I put in my next value as four, four squared is 16, there's my next ordered pair, okay? Here are the ordered pairs that represent solutions to this function. And they're all fulfilling the requirements of the function. And I can list them as the ordered pairs that I can also use to graph this function. Okay. Now, here's what I want you to notice. The X's are always called the domain because that is set A. That is the input that I'm putting into the function. The Y's are always referred to as the range. Okay. Because this is the output or the result or set B, what happens. When I put in those elements into the function, here's what happened. When I put in one, what happened was I stayed at one when I put it through this function. When I put in two and I put it in through this function over here, I got to four, okay? When I put in three from the X and I put it through this function, the corresponding value I got was nine. So you can see that the domain, or using the terms that we've been trying to tie together, the X's or the input is always your X's or set A, right? And the range, or as we talk about this, the Y's or the output, okay? or the result of your function set B is right here on the Y's of your graph, okay? So another way to talk about functions is to talk about the formulas. And we can take formulas that you're familiar with. In this case, for example, the formula for the area of a circle, and you can write it in function notation. Here we're saying the area of the circle is equal to pi times the radius squared. But what is affecting the rate, the area of the circle. Well, if you look at it, pi is a constant, so that's not what's making the change. What's making the change? What changes the area of a circle is if the radius changes, right? So really, the area is a function of what's happening to the radius. So I can restate this formula, I can restate it as the function of A of R, wherein you take pi and you multiply it times R squared. And what this shows you, and that's what we have highlighted right here, is that it shows you that the area of the circle is a function of the radius. That's what the function notation shows you. It's why we write function notation, because by using function notation, it right away allows you to see that relationship, that the area of a circle is affected by the size of the radius of that circle. So it shows you the relationship. That's why functions are a special type of relation between numbers, okay? Last but not least, and this you would see, you'll see more of when you move on to math uh, 117, which is the second uh, half of this course, you're gonna be talking a lot about geometry there, and you're gonna see that there is what we call geometric transformations, okay? Geometric transformations is when you take a shape that you can slide, turn, or flip on a graph, right? And it produces other shapes. This process can be viewed as a function where you're assigning the point from the original shape to another point in the same plane. And here is the example that they give you. And you can look at this example over on figure 9.28 on page 383. 
But basically what they're saying is if you start with this triangle, okay, and that triangle is made of point A, B, and C, if we put it through a function that tells you how much you have to flip each of these points by, it you put it through that function and you get these new points where A goes through the function and becomes D, B goes through that function and becomes E, C goes through that function and becomes F. And now you have this other triangle over here all because of this function that flipped the points, in this case, about the, this axis here. Okay, now that we're going to a lot more detail of that when we, you go and take the second half of this course, but you can see how we can describe this geometric transformation as a function. We took these points, which were ordered pairs. We put them through the function of what's happening, what's moving them. It creates these new corresponding values or points, okay, which also are an ordered pairs. So we can consider this transformation, in this case, a flip. We can talk about it as a function. All right, I'm gonna stop the share there, okay? Um, you have a homework assignment that's assigned for section 9.3 part B. It's already up under the tasks tab. It will be due by 1 p.m. on Wednesday, right before your test goes live. Your test is going to go live at 1 p.m. and it will be opened and available until 3 p.m. The test link can be found in the content area right where you find these videos and the homework assignments and my notes is where you'll see the test link. It will not go live until one, so you will not see the link until one. And then once you see the link, you can click on it. It will access a Word document, as I explained at our live session last Friday. That Word document will be editable, which means that you can work right within it and do your work there and then submit that very self-same um, document through the Dropbox. Or for those of you who are not too tech savvy, you can work out your your problems on lined paper and then you can take those pictures of your work and actually um, input or insert those pictures to each question on the document that I provide for you and then submit it that way into the Dropbox. Um, I, on occasion, I've had students that couldn't figure that out either, how to insert pictures into the document. They just did all their work on lined paper and then took pictures of their work and sent it to me um, via the Dropbox, like you submit your homework. Um, it's not my preferred method because if you're not very careful and neat, it will be hard for me to determine what question you're working on that corresponds to the questions on the test document. So I prefer if you can keep to using the test document or inserting your pic your work as pictures into the test document, but you do have those three options um, and to submit your test. And you do have to do so before the link closes. All right, I will see you on Friday for our live session where we will discuss the test that you will be taking on Wednesday. All right. Take care, guys.